So, last lecture today. Thank you very much for uh, your consistent uh, uh, visiting of this lecture. So, Matthias is also here, but I understand he cannot uh, switch on the video. To all the others, I thank very... Ah, hello. Uh, to all the others, I thank uh, for doing the, uh, the videos on. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, there is this Piotr. Uh, you, you are the only one who is not living in our sixth floor. Uh, thank you very much for your consistent uh, showing up here. And if you, whenever you want, please visit me in my office in the sixth floor. On, uh, or maybe we can discuss a little bit. Okay, good. So today, today is really a finishing of this lecture, where at least I have learned quite a lot. And uh, this again is very novel stuff, which just uh, came up in the, essentially all these things uh, came up in the last week which are some, uh, somewhat, uh, I would say, finishing elements of the theory which I have presented. So, first thing I start today is characterization. Of trivial Demash. To see. So you remember <clears throat> what we had in in R1. This is important in R1. There is a paper from the Stone Age of this theory by Chouye and Bagelberg in alphabetical order. <clears throat> when you have a mu and a nu and you have some martingale transport from the mu to the nu here, then this, uh, the real in R1, we have that there are intervals I1, I2, etc., and which remain invariant under every martingale transport. And the nice thing, there is a trivial such partition if you can transport from every point here, intuitively speaking, to every point here, where you have to put the mu almost everywhere and nu almost everywhere in the right way. So if you don't have this trivial partition that you can go from everywhere to everywhere, then you have at least two different such cells in R1 where you cannot go from here to here. So this is uh, forbidden and the other way around. Okay, this was in R1 and Demash 2C, which I have told you uh, already uh, last time, there is in RD, the situation is much more complicated, but there was this important result. There is an, a Demash 2C paving of Ix x in Rd. Uh, <clears throat> so the Ix and we call Cx, we call the closure of Ix. So these are closed convex subsets of Rd. The Ix are the relative interior of these uh, Cx. They are paving mu almost surely uh, all of Rd, and <clears throat> they are a substitute for this decomposition here into uh, disjoint intervals, which was, yeah, this was in 14. This paper was, I believe, in 18 or something, 18 or 17, around this. Okay, good. And now let me, let me formulate the, the theorem, or proposition, this is not a theorem. <clears throat> Here comes the proposition. We are 
we have a mu less than nu in convex order and we are on Rd. Everything has finite second moments. Okay, the following are equivalent. One. Okay. <laughs> Dimash 2c consists of a single cell I and I write it like this in C <coughs> and here without loss of generality open in RD and two but this is not so good here There does not exist an A and a B uh, with mu of A positive, mu of B positive, and <clears throat> such that P uh, of, uh, how do I write it, of A cross B uh, equals zero for all P in Martingale transport from mu to nu. Okay, so why, yes. Why do you put uh, not the negation? Why do you, do you put this formulation, not the negation of it? Uh, what is the negate? That does not exist in AB. Yeah, and I, I would suggest to say that for all AB there exists something which connects them. Okay, fine, fine. So this is... Okay, I rewrite it. Uh, for all AB there exists... No, but I, I, I leave it this way. But you are of course perfectly right that this is a more reasonable way of uh, phrasing it. Okay, but let me let me explain what it is here where, where we take the intuition from the R1 case. In the R1 case it means exactly there does not exist, if I remain at this uh, formulation, there does not exist a set A which has positive mu measure which would this, uh, uh, this thing, uh, for example, this I1 be here and for the B we take the I2 and as I told you before there is a non-trivial, passing to the negation of this, there is a non-trivial decomposition if, there, if I can single out two such sets such that from here to here you cannot transport and this means that for every Martingale transport the measure uh, the uh, set A cross B is not charged. Now, this is the intuition from R1. The same holds true for this thing here. And uh, yeah, so in this case, a cell could be, I come back to an example, which is in the Demash Tusi paper. So it can very well be that for an X here, this is the IX, for another X here, this is just this line here where you have to think the line is here uh, and because the, the, these are open sets so the, uh, you should think of this uh, triangle in the open way and as it turns out in this example if you want to look it up you cannot uh, transport anything from this set here to uh, this set with the mu and nu measures. Uh, let me just, so this is just how it looks like in, in RD, so in this case R2. And one warning here, in R1, yeah, it's, it's very intuitive and it's completely symmetric. I mean, in this case, you cannot transport from I1 to I2, if and only if you cannot transport from I2 to I1. In R2, it's more complicated 
As it turns out in this example, you cannot transport from here to here, but you can transport from here to here. So there is some... Uh, uh, I think this happens also in one dimension. If you think about the situation where you have an interval and the point, no? Yes, yes, yes. You're, you're right. You, you have, if you have an interval, yeah, uh, it may happen. You're right. Thank you. I hope I get a good one. So even if you, if you think in R1, if you think, for example, the mu is supported by the interior of such an interval plus a point measure at the boundary here. So hoping on this, a point measure here. And if the mu starts from here, but it transports to the, to the boundary points, and this here transports here, it may very well be that there is a transport from the interval to the point, but not the other way around. Thank you, Matthias. Okay, so this is the proposition which I want to show a proof, and it's a little bit tricky. It's not very straightforward, and I also add, in this case, in this case, we have that the C is equal to the support of nu, and this is a notation from Demarche Tusi. This means the closed convex hull of the support of nu, and I is the interior of C. As I told you, without loss of generality, we can always uh, shrink the situation down to a to an affine subspace of Rd, in which things are open in this case. Okay, so let us try to give a proof. So how do we do? Okay, so the proof goes as follows. From one to two, it's immediately just consider a standard Brownian motion because what we have proved in in previous uh, uh, in, in in previous lectures is if Demarche Tusi is trivial, then there exists a uh, stretched a standard stretch brown emotion and intuitively speaking the stretch brown emotion goes from everywhere to everywhere uh, and so you have this negation here so this is very easy if you take a standard stretch brown emotion we don't really need this result which I have cumbersomely proved here in the lecture you can take any Demarche Tusi transport where they proved that these transport take exactly the uh, interior, uh, the I transport on uh, the corresponding C with, with, with this uh, uh, relation here satisfied. So summing up, this is easy. The tricky thing is in the other direction. So how do we do? So let P bar be a, what I just mentioned, what I call a Demarche 2C uh, Martingale transport. So what does this mean? This means uh, that, <coughs> uh, yeah, denote by Ix, X in Rd, the Demarche 2C paving, which uh, by hypothesis, uh, yeah, which a priori consists of many such things. We want to show uh, that there is only one. And what a Demarche 2C Martingale transport verifies that for mu almost each X, <coughs> we have that pi X. And I give this a bar, a bar, P bar X. We take the support 
and the closed convex hull is, is equal to the CX. So, in, in other words, when I take this picture and the triangle is the IX, then I know that for any point X in here, it is transported to a measure which has such that the closed convex hull uh, of uh, the measure here is the whole triangle. Good. So this exists, for example, a standard Brownian motion, which is now not standard, uh, sorry, a stretched Brownian motion, which a priori has no reason to be standard, but we know that for a stretched Brownian motion we have this property. Okay, and now I show you the decisive lemma. Okay, we all remember this. Oops, sorry, bad preparation of the lecture. Most, imp most important things were not provided. So, lemma, <clears throat> suppose that one holds, which means trivial Dimash to C. Okay, then we have three assertions. First of all, for mu, almost each x in i. Okay, I have still, I have to tell you something. Uh, let c equal support of nu, close convex hull, and i the interior of C. I had this notion before. So we start at the global picture. We take the entire new. This lives in a C, can very well be RD. Think of RD, yeah? So for mu, almost each X in I, we have <coughs> IX bar, which is equal to CX is equal uh, uh, to uh, support. Am I a question? Just a moment, just a moment. Pi x. Uh, okay, this thing here. Yeah. Yes. Who had a so question? I, you've written that c equals the support of mu, right? C equals the support of nu. This is a nu. So is this, this is an assumption, right? Uh, no, this is just a notation. Uh, okay, so... Because I thought that we in a, in a setting that C equals the support of pi bar. Yeah, we have the ix and the cx, okay, and we have the i and the c. This is the Dimash Tusi. Okay. Uh, this mm -hmm. is the global thing. What we want to show eventually that each i x is equal to i. This is what we want to show. But this is just a notation, which maybe is not very good, but that's the way I wrote it up. Okay, so this is the first thing. <laughs> so, for each one, this is the entire thing, b, for mu almost each x in c minus i, we have the following <coughs> that 
i bar x, the same thing, equals cx is contained in the boundary of uh, c. So the boundary of c is the closure minus the interior. Remember, this is open in Rd, so this is fine. And c uh, mu of the boundary of c is equal to zero. So many pencils, and I hope I find one which works properly. <clears throat> okay, this looks better. So this is boundary of C. Good. Now, this is, you should, you should imagine something like this here. Well, this is a bad picture because these two lines are identical. It is just, this is the line in the closure and here is the, uh, the boundary of the open set. Okay, the first... Th huh? So, uh, the assumption now is that we have a trivial Dimash to the component, yeah? Exactly, yeah. Okay, so, and, I mean, if mu equal mu equal the Dirac measure, then... Yeah, okay, if mu equal mu is a Dirac measure, okay, you have this thing here, then you have i is equal to c uh, is equal to this point x. Yeah, in this case, this is, this is a little, uh, better even wrote it up nicely. Uh, in the case where i is just one point, then the relative interior of its closure, which again is, is this point here, is defined as the one point set. Okay, the boundary of c is? Uh, the boundary of c in this case, yeah, the boundary of c in this case is the empty set, okay? And which is perfectly fine with this lemma here. Okay, yeah, um, the boundary is just not the boundary in the usual sense. Yes, yes, but this is, this is, uh, yeah, Bertram worked this out nicely. And uh, uh, th there is a footnote in, in Opus 1 uh, which, uh, which takes care of this situation. Yeah, but what I mean, the boundary of C, which is, yeah, Good, Just but it point. takes... This is the relative boundary, okay? Ah, ah yes, uh, sorry. Ah, this is... Okay. No, no, it is the boundary because without loss of generality, we have assumed that this thing here, this is open in Rd. So that's okay. So therefore, this thing is, is trivially excluded. Fine, Matthias? Good. Okay, good. So this is really the boundary because we are in the in the global set here. Maybe you should, you should just say that the boundary is the affine closure minus the affine interior. Yeah, this would be one way or another so way the, that without loss of generality you have this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good, 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 good. So the A uh, now, yeah. Now these things here, these three things which we uh, will prove consecutively, they Im Im imply the proposition because it says that for every mu here, the, uh, the support is the whole thing, okay? For every mu here, well, the first thing is whenever you have a mu, some measure in the boundary, then also uh, the closure where it is transported to remains in the boundary. Okay, and once I have this thing here, then I conclude that the mu of the boundary is zero, therefore this thing here cannot happen. This thing cannot happen, and the only possibility is this one which remains. Right, I'm super lost now. I thought the, okay. what we want to show is that two implies one, and now the lemma has one as an assumption. Uh, okay. Now, now, let me, may, may, I, may I try again? So proof of one implies two uh, of the proposition, okay? I think we wanted to, to, to have the other direction, no? 
Was it? Uh, wait a moment. Wait a moment. We have. Uh, yeah, you wanted. We wanted the other direction. Uh, uh, da -da ah, sorry. Uh, I, I I make. Uh, suppose that two holes. Ah, yeah. Suppose that two holes. Sorry, sorry. Thank you very much. What I suppose that is not. I, I got confused here with the with the one and the two. Uh, suppose that uh, two holes, which is that there does not exist an A and a B, etc., or for every A and B, and we can, and I claim that I can prove this thing here once I've proved the lemma. Okay, good, Matthias, you with me? I love this much better. Huh? Yes, uh, very nice. Okay, okay, now. If you, if you have two implies one, I want to show that there exists only one Demash 2C thing. Okay, then I know that for every x which is in the, in the C, we have the trivial thing that this is already, that uh, we have already, uh, da -da, the I, I bar of x equals uh, sup ah. And what I really need it is super x, and what I have here is equal to c. Sorry, it was some time that I wrote this up. Okay, so what, what a says here in the lemma, whenever you start with an x, which I think in the open triangle, then I know that the soup of pi <coughs> of pi uh, bar x and pi bar x is the De Marsh 2C, uh, uh, the, the De Marsh 2C Martingale transport, for example, stretch brown in motion, it has as a support, it has the whole triangle here. Okay, now B and C, B is just a, a, a step to prove C. I can prove that the boundary does not contain any, C, any mu measure. Therefore, the whole mu measure is here, because where, where else can it be? And for each such x, the support of this p bar x is the entire thing. And therefore, this proves one of the proposition that there is only one Demash 2c thing. Matthias, you agree? Yes. Yes. Okay, so bottom line, if we prove the lemma, we have proved our proposition. Good. Now, okay, so proof of the lemma. So the first thing, the first thing, okay. Uh, so what we do, we take, we take Kn are compact in I, <coughs> in this set I, in the global set I, uh, such that union of the Kn is equal to this I. So we just take an exhausting uh, thing and, and what we do is, so I make a picture here now. This is our i, we have here the kn, and what we do, we take finitely many slices, a slice is something like this, which you can uh, cut away. <coughs> there are slices, which I write s n k equal the x in c, such that x uh, y and k is greater than max over the xi in kn, xi y and k. Okay, so for example, if this is the direction given by a y and k, which is in the sphere of Rd, so this is the direction, then this slice here 
are all the points x which are in here such that in this direction, measured in this direction, ah, in, yeah, if the y and k goes in this direction, in this direction it is bigger than the biggest value of the km. Okay, by compactness we find for every n we find finitely many of such things and these are all together, they are countably many. So they are countably many. Now I claim, claim for every four, <clears throat> yeah, and mu almost every x in uh, i of x, uh, we must have pi bar x of uh, c minus <coughs> uh, s, or let's write it this way, pi bar of s and k is bigger than zero for all n and k. <coughs> Why? Take any point x here in the interior of this ball and suppose the point x gives measure zero to one of these slices here, to one of this S, S, uh, S and K. Well, then the support of this has to be contained in this thing here. <coughs> uh, oh no, I don't need this yet. Suppose that for some x this thing here is not charged. And suppose that there is a set, a mu measure, uh, a set with positive mu measure such that they don't charge this fixed slice here. Well, I then... For all x in i of x. Ah, sorry, sorry, this is not i of x, this is i. Sorry. Oops. Okay. For, we take the i, yeah, for all x in i, <coughs> we must have that for mu almost all x in i, we must have this. Otherwise, yeah, suppose there is some nk such that the x such that pi bar x of s and k is equal to zero and that this has mu measure positive, then we take this as our set A, we take uh, B, we take this as our set B and then we have found here a set A with positive mu measure and all these A's cannot transport into this slice here and this is a contradiction to our assumption 2 here. Okay, so what we have, yeah, it's okay? Question? No, yeah, yeah, question. So the, the pi you choose here, this is the Dimash 2 pi. This is the Dimash 2 c yeah, I, I wrote it somewhere. Okay, so what you show is that the Dimash 2 c pi doesn't transport from every A to every B, okay? Exactly, yes. Yeah, but this doesn't show that uh, there exists no pi that does that. No, 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 no. Now we are at the good uh, negation. Uh, if the pi bar x does not transport uh, each x in the, mu each x in the interior to something with full support, then all the others uh, don't do it either. The Dimash 2c has the property that for almost all x it has, uh, it has the corresponding full support. Does this? Dimash 2c has, has the maximal uh, occupation of, the, of the, the, the cx here. Does this answer the question, Matthias? Or, or, or I write it up again, what the Dimash 2c does. Huh? No, no. So, what I, okay. so what you tell me is that um, 
If the Image 2 doesn't work, then no pie works. Exactly. This is, yeah. yeah. And that, uh, uh, um, this is not clear to me. Uh -huh. So what the Image 2 here has proved is that for mu, almost each x, uh, we, uh, we have support of the pi bar x, which is the Demash Tusi, is equal to Cx. Okay? So in this case, the Demash Tusi would be contained for all these axes in this set here. So therefore, yeah, therefore they, uh, what do I have? Therefore, no other, the, 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 the C of X for these axes here would be contained in this thing here. And why is this a contradiction for you almost every uh, thing? Uh, let's, let's discuss, the, let's, let's take the example of the triangle, okay? Yes, yes. And uh, let's make this uh, into one trivial component, okay? Okay, so there is no mass here, but some there is mass. mass here. There is some mass here, but it's uh, charged only from the interior of the triangle, okay? Okay, yeah. Okay, now I can define uh, the mass 2 z yeah. yeah, which goes, which puts mass to all these three extreme points. Yeah. Um, so what I want to do is I want to put some uh, one-dimensional back measure on this uh, line on the left. Yeah. And I want to have two points in my triangle. Uh, so, two so, points, yeah. So mu has to start uh, from two points A and B, which are both in the triangle, okay? Okay, yeah. So these are the points A and B, you said, yeah. yeah. Okay, and good. Then on the triangle, I also take a, put a two-dimensional back measure, okay? Okay. Um, what I can now do is I can define a martingale coupling. Yeah. Which uh, um, starts in the point A. Yeah. And charges only the two-dimensional back measure. Okay. Fine. And yeah. And if it starts in the point B, it charges the two-dimensional back measure and the back measure on the line. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a Dimash 2 z This is a Dimash 2 z Yes. Yeah. Okay. But. Um, <laughs> Yeah. I don't know, depending on whether, you sh whether or not you start in the point A or in the point B, you're going to charge uh, the measure on the left hand side or not. Yes, but uh, the, the point is you take the closure. In both cases, you have, whether you start from A or from B, the closed convex yeah. hull yeah, of so the support. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So The coupling I just now defined, yeah? Yeah. This is... Yeah, this is a Dimash 2 z coupling. Yes. But it is not a coupling that universally works to have property 2. Uh, to have property 2? Uh, no, I mean, why is this a counterexample? I mean, in this case, the, each... The point from which we only charge uh, the two-dimensional back measure. Yeah. Or the two-dimensional yeah. back measure plus the back measure here. Yes, but, but this yeah. does not change this quantity here. This quantity remains the same for the points A and B. Uh, okay, what I want to point out is that um, the Demar, what we think um, for this property too, yeah? Yeah. To find for any A and B. Yes. Some measure pi that connects A to B, okay? Yes. Okay. And what you require is that the Dimash 2 z coupling is doing that. Yes. And this is not true. In the example, uh, with, uh, claim, uh, the Dimash 2 z coupling. Okay, but this I, this I haven't claimed. This I haven't, well, maybe, maybe I go formally through this argument again. Okay, Matthias? Do you agree? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So our assumption is two with the A's and the B's. Okay, my claim is, let's, let's do it once again, for every X in the open, 
in the interior of the support of new, we must have that it charges any such slice, okay? Like this one here. Yes, yeah, so, okay. so this pi is the Dimash Tusi thing, yeah? This is the Dimash Tusi thing, okay? <clears throat> because what we have, uh, suppose we, we go from A, which, is, which is, uh, has this property that they don't charge the, uh, the, 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 this S and K. So for example, this point X, which only goes within this half moon here, okay? If this has positive, pro uh, a positive measure, then if you take this as A, and if you take this as B, uh, it is, yeah, why is this a contradiction to, to uh, Demash Tusi? You would have that these axes, uh, uh, for these pi axes, the C yeah, of X is, yeah? It's not enough to contradict Demash Tusi. I mean, I think you really have to contradict this property too. Uh, yeah, yeah, you have to contradict uh, the property two. Yeah, the the property two would be that there is a yeah there is a set A that the B this thing here. This has positive measure. Yeah, and by definition, I mean, I I just got got confused. I mean, it's it's trivial. By definition, no X can transport in this set A can transport anything to this set B, and the, the new of B is positive, because we have the new charges, uh, where do I have the, the, the support of new, uh, the closed convex hull of this is the support of new is equal to C. And then this would be a set which contains the support of new, which is a contradiction. Do you agree? Um, I reserve the possibility to discuss it at a later point. Okay, you. okay. But my claim is that this, taking this as a set A and this as a set B, we get a contradiction to, uh, uh, to uh, the uh, property or uh, item number two. Okay, I've written it up here. Whoever wants, please tell me uh, there is a written version of the, uh, of the argument here. Okay, but I go on. Uh, Matthias, permitting? I go yes. on? Okay, yes. anybody else has reservations? Ah, I've erased the B and the C. This is bad, but I can. So what we have now, I want to show the B, which I have here. <clears throat> okay, now the B was, if we have an X in the boundary of C, and this is really the boundary, and we have for mu almost each x, I have that the cx uh, is contained again in the boundary of c. So the idea is the following. If you have an x here, now think of this as the closed triangle, <coughs> or rather, rather if we would again think of this example, x is in this line here, so it's in the closure of the triangle. Okay, now I claim that the cx, which is defined as the, or by Demash 2 c is equal to pi x bar, must be in the boundary. And this is clear because any x, any x in the boundary of c by Han Banach is contained in a subspace which 
uh, uh, does not touch the interior of C. You can separate this point here from this open set by Hambanach. So the whole thing, this X here, lies in this hyperplane here. And when you have any pi X, so this is, by the way, this is the pi bar X from Demash Tusi. If you have the pi pi X, then of course it cannot get out of this uh, hyperplane here. So this was a cheap shot, the B. Okay, and now we come to the C. What was the C? I have that the mu cannot charge the boundary of C. <clears throat> then we are finished. Okay, so uh, the mu of the boundary of C. For this I take, I do the following. Okay, so this is our I, which is the open set and the C. And what do I, uh, what do I define? I define for, I define a set Y, A, Y, Epsilon are equal to the X in the boundary of C, <coughs> such that uh, uh, such that there exists an eta uh, <coughs> in sphere of Rd with eta minus y less than epsilon and and eta exposes X. I give you a picture in a moment. So I start with a Y in the sphere of RD. I mean they all are bad right now. In the sphere of RD. So Think of the y which goes in this direction. And now I look, what does it mean when we start with y itself? When we start with y itself, what does it mean at point x? Yes? Yes? Aha. Aha. So, hello. Good. Alles klar, Matthias, du weißt schon, dass du... Ja, nein, ich weiß nicht, dass ich nicht bin. Ja, danke. Okay. So, uh, this is the direction of y. And this point x is exposed by y if y attains its maximum here. Okay. But now, we not only take the y, we take all the etas, which are close to y. So here is the eta. This direction is the one of eta. And what we get is the, this set here is the set which I call A, Y, Epsilon. A, Y, Epsilon is the set which are exposed by elements eta, which are close to Y. So you can imagine this as such a thing here. You can visualize this. Okay, good. And now <coughs> I claim the following. I claim the following. First of all, uh, so um, where, where am I? Yeah, <coughs> first of all, uh, there are four epsilon greater zero. Can you read this? Hmm. There are finitely many. Shit! Y k uh, k equal one to n such that
such that the y, the, the a y k epsilon cover the boundary of C. I think you see this from this picture. You can have this is for the y, this is so if this is y1, this is for the for the direction y2, and yeah, by some compactness or so. I mean this is covered by finitely many such things. Okay? And now the next claim is <coughs> uh, for every uh, okay if epsilon is small enough then a y epsilon closed convex hull is uh, a set contained properly in C. So it may happen if you think of a convex set which looks like this. A convex set, if the C looks like this. Then in this case, if you choose the Y here, it may very well be that the AY epsilon is this whole arc here. And when you take the closed convex hull, you get back the whole set C. But this only works until some epsilon if you take the epsilon small enough, this cannot work anymore. And therefore, when epsilon is small enough, you have the situation that this does not cover uh, all of, <coughs> of uh, y uh, epsilon. Okay, now why does this give uh, a contradiction now? In this case, I take <coughs> uh, a, I take a y epsilon such that mu of a is positive. Okay, uh, in order to prove c, <coughs> I want to prove this thing here. So suppose mu of boundary c is bigger than zero and let's work towards a contradiction. Okay, then in this case, there exists a k such that if I take a equal a y k epsilon, uh, then the mu of a is positive. Why? Because finitely many of them cover the boundary. Altogether, they have positive measure. Therefore, there must be one of those which has positive measure. Okay, now... Uh, this has positive mu measure, this I take as an A, as a B I can take here the complement. Uh, yeah, in this case it's a slice, this thing here again, the complement of A, the B here, is a, a convex set again, which is contained in the C and the mu of B, where B is the uh, difference from say C minus A and from this thing uh, and the closed convex hull of this is also positive and we have found a pair A and B such that mu such that the <coughs> we have that the uh, wait a moment wait a moment uh, the yeah yeah, I have forgotten to uh, tell you one thing. Okay, <coughs> uh, each a <coughs> y epsilon is invariant under, well, in this case we can take any pi in mt mu nu. Why? <coughs> because if I have the a uh, such an a y epsilon, I make here a picture, suppose the suppose the c is like this and 
we have that the uh, that the this a y is of this form such that it goes over here. Okay, but then you see whenever you take an x in this a y epsilon. I cannot leave uh, this thing because I had before in B, you remain in the boundary and in fact you remain in this hyperplane here which touches uh, at the point X and similar for these things. So the each AY is invariant under any pi. So therefore this thing here, uh, the, uh, uh, the <coughs> any pi cannot transport any measure from this set E to the complement of the closed convex hull of this thing here because it has to remain in the A Y epsilon. Summing up, uh, I have now proved the lemma and the lemma implies the proposition. I understand that, yeah, I told you I still need a proof of this thing here. Okay, so I think intuitively it's clear that when you take small enough epsilons, then you can uh, <coughs> then you cannot have this phenomenon here. Uh, and yeah, I wrote up a proof, uh, but I can also give it this proof as an exercise. Okay, good. Then. Everybody is most welcome who is interested that I give this uh, him or her these papers and Matthias reserved the right to discuss every detail what I'm looking forward and I close now. I don't close the lecture yet. I don't close the lecture yet because I want to mention one more thing which just happened yesterday and today. So but this story is finished now with the characterization of the Mashtusi. What we have discussed last time was, was something, <coughs> you remember we had this mu epsilon t was the peacock which we regularized with some uh, Gaussian uh, distributions and then we proved that there is a mimicking process. And the question I left open last time is the question of, of uniqueness. And I put a, a, a question mark last time and the interesting thing is no uniqueness whatsoever for d greater than 2. In the one dimensional case we have lots, uh, we have very precise uniqueness results uh, by, by Lauther as I told you, uh, but there is no uniqueness whatsoever and here is in the most trivial example which is, or the, the most basic example which is BT, say between 1 and 2 for convenience but that's not very important. This is standard Brownian motion, say in R2. Okay, <coughs> good. This is the, and let mu t equal the law of bt, which is of course in the uh, normal distribution with t times identity here in R2. We are in R2. Okay. Now how can we mimic this thing? Okay, we want to have a process mt 
between 1 and 2 this time, <clears throat> which is a martingale, hopefully with nice properties, which is a martingale and uh, which mimics, everybody knows this now, that the marginal distributions are equal to this mu t. I mean, this is, of course, the most regular thing which you can e imagine. So, what are these empties? Of course, there is one obvious one, namely the Brownian motion. But what I will show you now, there are also others, and there are very many others. And there's a very nice thing that we just found out a few hours ago, uh, that there is in the uh, uh, thesis of Ben, uh, there is already a counterexample. Uh, to this situation here. And now, the idea is the following. So here I have Rd, R2. Okay, here I have a, a circle of radius R. Okay, and we look, we want to, we look at Mt is equal to R, <coughs> condition on. So I want to, to uh, construct such a martingale which should have nice properties uh, and in order to develop the idea I suppose that at some time t, doesn't matter which time, we are on a, here is the position of mt of omega. Okay, now from here you can either go on like a brown emotion but you can also do the following thing. You just make a radial distribution. <coughs> so call it d empty. t and I give this here, I give it a not because this is not yet our good uh, thing here, is equal to d b t times m t of, yeah, mt of omega uh, divided by mt. So in other words, here I take the unit vector. This is the unit vector in the radial direction, which is this thing here, okay? This is the unit vector, and I let a Brownian motion go here along this line here, where this is one, so it's a standard Brownian motion on this half line. Well, Eventually, it will hit zero, then this is only motivational, then, then, then we just stop it. Okay, now will this, uh, uh, will this uh, process, which is a martingale of course, will it mimic our, uh, our marginal distribution? No, because in this direction, now call it the radial direction, what do we have? We have the D, uh, uh, make it this thing here, dBt. What is it in the, uh, <coughs> uh, when you take the Brownian motion, the original Brownian motion, how does it move in the, <coughs> in the radial direction? Uh, well, uh, this is, yeah, this is, equal to the move in the, in, the, in the radial direction. And what is this? This is exactly this dm not t, okay, plus some drift dt, okay. <clears throat> so uh, the Brownian motion uh, is in this direction. Of course, it has a standard diffusion. Uh, but it also has a drift in this direction because the circular movement by Ito's formula, there is a curvature here, so it drives it out. And this is uh, some, well, it scales with, Ben will know it better, it scales with r to the minus one, I believe, and some constant. Or is it r to the minus two, Ben? Uh, ben, you have to turn on your... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I think, I think it's r to the minus one. Yeah. yeah okay. Sorry. So the closer you are 
to the origin, the stronger is this drift here. Okay, <clears throat> so there is the radial process has a positive drift here. Yeah, so therefore this does not mimic. But now you can do something else. You can turn the direction, and this is what Ben did in his, uh, uh, in his thesis. You can do, turn the direction instead of letting the, the uh, Brownian motion go in the radial direction, you turn it a little bit, okay? By here some angle theta, which I, uh, I keep free for the moment. And what we do is that uh, it should be when you project this thing onto the radial axis, this again should have length one here. So I choose this vector, which I call the vector A of mt, and I replace this thing here, I replace it by A of mt, and here I erase the zero. So this is what I want to do. I replace this thing by a turned direction and which I also scale properly such that the projection onto the line here becomes one. Okay, then the dpt is again has in this direction, the diffusion coefficient remains one, but this thing here is changed. So this you can change, and by changing the theta, you can make it zero. Uh, you can make it, ah, sorry, sorry, I'm on the wrong thing. This is the one from the BT, which we want to mimic. So here, when I take this MT, I get here some drift which goes out, and the drift depends on the theta and on the R, but you can, you can calculate it. And by choosing the theta, theta rightly, you, we just put in what we need here. So, well, uh, all these are, uh, yeah, easy, easy formulas which you can get. So I put here, I put something <coughs> of, uh, call it a function of theta uh, and r that when you choose this theta here, you get an outward drift. And I want that this thing here is equal to this thing here, which I can achieve. And there are formulas and all this is nicely written up in the thesis of Ben. And I just found it out uh, two hours ago. And then yesterday night we were, we were discussing it. Good, what is the bottom line? The bottom line is this is a way of, uh, well, doing a, a diffusion, uh, which is a martingale driven by a one-dimensional brown emotion here, which perfectly mimics the most natural peacock, uh, which you can imagine. And how much time do I have left? Yeah, quite a bit. Let me say, this is of course not the only solution. Well, there are now trivial variations that uh, during certain intervals you can do this regime and during the other intervals you can take this regime. But you can also, instead of starting with a one-dimensional radial Brownian motion, you can also start with something which has some uh, tangential motion. So that the covariance matrix corresponds to this ellipsoid here. And uh, so it's driven by a two-dimensional uh, Brownian motion which has uh, these components. Now you do a similar thing, you turn it a little bit, you rescale it, etc., and you can achieve the, the same thing again. Well, the question if you want to do so. Good. So this takes care of the, you, we cannot expect here, no uniqueness whatsoever. And this finish this thing and I'm looking forward to uh, continuing this discussion with Ben. Uh, and this of course completes nicely this result on the, uh, on the regularized peacocks. And then I have one more. This was this thing. 
I have prepared something. I still have 17 minutes. Well, I can at least give you I can state the theorem and uh, the proposition on which it relies. Which also completes one of the themes of these lectures. But what a nice coincidence, Ben, that uh, <laughs> this is exactly what you did yes. in your, in your uh, thesis. A, a nice surprise for me yesterday when I, <laughs> I discovered this, yeah. But you agree, it fits perfectly into this uh, framework of thinking, yeah? Yes, it's very nice. That, uh, I would never have thought of it. Uh, I didn't think of it years ago when I was writing the thesis at all in, in that way, but it's, uh, yeah, it's very nice. Good. So, here is uh, a theorem. We are again the mu less than nu in Rd. Nothing else is required. Okay, there exists a sequence delta n going sufficiently fast to zero. Okay, search that. For every sequence psi n in, <coughs> we had this space here, but this matters little, and they are d2 over 2 convex, if you remember this story. For any such, the, the idea is it's an optimizing sequence for the dual problem, and we want that the dual function. You don't have to remember the details, but there was a dual function and a primal function uh, from the Lagrangian, and that this is bigger than v mu nu minus delta n. Okay, v mu nu, this is the uh, value of, the, of our uh, stretch Brownian motion problem. This was, and this is by our duality results, this is the soup over all the size of the deep size. Okay, well, we have tried to identify the optimizer, etc. We have worked a lot on this. Okay, and the psi n should be close to the optimal value up to a pre given sequence uh, delta n. Then it follows that for mu almost each x, uh, we, you remember these things here, psi n x of dot n equals 1 to infinity. The psi n's, they were these optimizing functions and all the trick was that we were uh, considering them modulo affine functions and the affine functions we chose for the given x here we choose them in such a way that the psi n are at the point x are equal to zero. Uh, they are only d square over 2 convex. But the idea is that here at x they have value zero and the, uh, the tangent is or uh, that zero is in the subdifferential of this thing here. Uh, okay, so if you take this psi n x, the idea is that psi n x should work well in our i x here. I make a one dimensional picture. It does not work well when I'm out here. If you remember the, the example of the two geometric Brownian motions, so when we normalize the psi n by the x on the positive axis, we expect or hope to get the good psi n's here, which converge to the optimizer, while they don't give any information here. Here it goes away to plus infinity. 
Okay, and conversely, if you start with an X here, then it should give you good information here and nothing here on this side. So, can we have a general situation here? Well, the sine X, it suffices that for mu almost each X, we get the psi n x, we get that i of x is equal, uh, no, it's contained in the set of y such that the limit n goes to infinity psi n x of y is finite and rd minus c of x is equal, is contained in the y's such that uh, <coughs> uh, the limit in psi n x y is equal to infinity. So... Is this really hard to read now, Walter? Ah, yeah, I'm sorry. Good. Uh, maybe I repeat it. I'm really, well, it's the last lecture. I'm almost through to these pencils. That's not better either, is it? No. Well, I try. Better? Are the Sorry. Well, maybe I make a picture. <coughs> I make a picture. Well, here is the R2. Oh, this works nicely. Here I have a point X. I have, here is the IX. Okay, now here are these functions, psi n X of y. Then it tells you that the ix on ix, these are exactly, the, no, not exactly, sorry, they are contained in the points where this limit here of the psi nx, can you read it? Where they converge to something finite, okay? This is the way I get the ix, while on the rd minus cx, so out here, out here it converges to plus infinity, which means the set where this limit, not lim sup or lim in for anything, the limit of these things is equal to infinity, uh, this uh, contains rd minus cx. It still remains to analyze the boundary here. I don't say anything about the boundary. I believe one can still sharpen this uh, to also say something about the boundary. But let's leave this as, as the moment. And I tell you the, the, uh, the wonderful thing. The, remember, this Demash 2 C decomposition is a highly non-trivial thing. It, the, there are not countably many components. There are... There are many, there is some measurability, which is tricky, involved, etc. But what this tells you here <coughs> is that just take any sequence of dual optimizers, which have this property. That's not important. This is important. Okay. And which uh, go sufficiently quickly to the optimum. Okay. Where this is given from the very beginning. Okay then we can, for mu almost each x, more we cannot uh, uh, ask for, we get the corresponding cells of the, uh, the Demash 2 c thing. We get it by looking at where this sequence here, this is one simple sequence of nice continuous functions. They tell you where they remain finite and converge or uh, converge to infinity, this distinguish the ix from the cx. Okay, so at least I could tell you the, the uh, theorem. I can also state the, 
the proposition which we uh, no, I don't, I don't state it. This becomes too technical. I tell you uh, what we have done and related to what we have done, we have done, can you? Yeah, one can see it. Uh, uh, what we have done is the case of a, a single C equals C of X. This I have done the last two lectures, I believe, that when we suppose that there is only one, then we, uh, we have done an analysis and we have done this Psi N uh, and we have, after taking subsequences and convex combinations, etc., uh, we have found that in Ix they converge and in Rd minus Cx they do not converge. Now, the, the tricky point is for the single cell, uh, we could not say it for the original sequence Psi n, but only for a subsequence and a sequence of convex combinations. Now, can we have it for the original Psi n? Well, for this you need a quantitative version of this, that when in the case of a single one, when you are close enough to the optimum, that then you can have a quantitative control of, the, uh, of, of this convergence here. And this is possible by, by looking at the construction once again. And, and once you have this, when you have it for every cell, then doing a little me measure theory uh, that when you take the delta n quick enough, then for almost all cells it's also quick enough and you can conclude. With this, I don't go into any further details. I just tell you that I enjoyed uh, this, uh, these lectures. Uh, as I told you, at least I learned uh, quite a bit during the lectures. And uh, I'm very happy that we made some progress on these uh, things. And everybody is, of course, invited to contact me or many other people in the sixth floor uh, and to continue on uh, these topics. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. It was a very nice surprise to see the, uh, yeah. these, these new things presented today. Excellent, okay. Um, yeah. It would be, um, yeah, I'm quite excited about, uh, about how this is being used. It would be great to, to discuss it some more yeah. um, when you have time. Um, I'll, be, I'll be coming to the department now, so. Uh, no, I, I'm leaving the department now. Uh, I'll come back at 3, 3.30 or something like this. And I'm working on this with Goody, you know, as you know. Yes, and yes, I, 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 yes I, I spoke a bit more with Goody last yeah, time. Yeah. I guess you know. I guess you know and found the, uh, I showed him this, uh, this where, where these formulas are, yeah? Yeah, okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I would, I would propose we continue to, to work the three of, uh, of us on these issues here. Yeah, that would, and, that yeah. would, be, uh, that would be brilliant, yeah. yeah, yeah. And we come... Yeah, it's really exciting. Yeah, we come together in the in the later afternoon. Okay. Perfect. Then, okay. Uh, thanks again. Thanks again for the lectures, and I'll see you later. It was a pleasure, and this was a really a pleasant surprise at the very end. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so, goodbye. Okay. Bye bye.